Stephen, right. I'm tired. I apologise. Right. <laughs> That's why I've got my notes in front I of me as well. <laughs> so forgive me if I'm if I'm a little bit slower than I would usually be. It is an awfully long way. Um, so yes, thank you for inviting me to come over and talk about the SWOT of building an Australian biobank. So when I was invited to talk, I was asked to talk about the Australian biobank. And I thought, how can I do this in a structured way? How can I kind of go through telling what this story is? So this is what I came up with, I thought, going through it in that very traditional strength, weakness, opportunity, and threats, just to give you a little flavor of what it is that we're doing. So I'm going to start by giving you a little bit of background about how our biobank came about. So we are very lucky in Australia that we have a philanthropic organi based organisation, the Mason Foundation. So it's actually a legacy endowment fund that was established by uh, Judith Jane Mason in the name of her father, Harold Stanich Williams. So the full foundation is called Judith Jane Mason and Harold Stanich Williams Memorial Foundation. And the Mason Foundation for a number of years now has been funding biomedical research into MECFS in Australia. They disperse around a million dollars per year in a competitive grant round. Now, about three years ago, the trustees uh, who manage this foundation invited some consultants to do an exercise about were we really creating the most impact that we could with the money that was being dispersed. And what the consultants found was that there was a, a sort of rate limiting step for the scientists in Australia. And the limiting step was obtaining patient samples and matched healthy control samples. So there was duplication happening around Australia and the duplication in the, the, tr the effort that you have to go to to recruit patients, to inform them, to consent them and, and, and all of that aspect. And they decided that if we could put aside some of that $1 million a year and establish an Australian MECFS biobank, then that would increase the overall impact. So that's just a little bit of a, a background on what the process was. Um, and then I think that what I'll do is I will just jump into my, my sort of overall, um, overall presentation. So the first thing I want to talk about is the strength of, our, of us in building a biobank is really the quality of science that we have in Australia and also the huge engagement of the patient community. We're very, very lucky. The weakness that I'm going to talk about is area versus population in Australia. The opportunity that we have that has made this whole thing possible is a combination of things, but particularly telehealth nursing, which we've started doing. And um, we have a system of pathology clinics, a really excellent network of pathology clinics in Australia. And um, we also have the symptom tracking app that Sadie is going to talk about from Solve ME CFS tomorrow. And we also have an aspect of GP education, which I'm going to talk about a little bit. And then just at the end of my presentation, I'm going to talk about the threat, which is the quality of samples and the true diagnosis of patients. And I'd say that the first three here, the strength, the weakness and the opportunity are all quite specifically Australian. Um, and the threat is something that I think is, um, is true for everyone working in this area of research. Okay, so one of our main strengths, as I have said, is the quality of science in Australia plus the strength of community support and engagement. So, oh, I'm now trying to do two different things at the same because I think this one's going to move that one and it isn't. Um, okay, so the quality of our science. We're very lucky that we have a number of um, very well-respected research groups in Australia. Um, and I'm just going to go through a few of them to see, you know, that you may or may not be familiar with. So we have the University of Melbourne who specialise in metabolomics. Um, we currently have a group run by Associate Professor Paul Gooley and we also have Neil McGregor. Uh, we also have two other groups at Melbourne University who we're working with. We have the Human Computer Interaction Lab and they're working with us on a separate project. And we're also very lucky that Emerge Australia has two Juris Doctor students working on a project with us at the moment about financial access for patients uh, for, with, with a disability. Um, so we have very good support overall from the University of Melbourne. 
There's also an excellent group at La Trobe run by Professor Paul Fisher and Dr. Sarah Ansley. They have a team there predominantly working on mitochondria. Um, they recently published two papers in the International Journal of Molecular Science showing high levels of discrimination between MECFS patients and healthy controls when looking at immortalized lymphocytes. We've got groups at Australian National University and UTAS, University of Tasmania. Both of those groups are data focused. Sorry, I've adapted and I say data instead of data. I can't, I can't get out of it. Um, so they're really, they're looking at the numbers. Um, both connected with epidemiology and we have excellent support from both of those groups. On the Sunshine Coast and Griffiths University, both up in Queensland, we have two groups doing imaging um, and they're really working on MRIs. And then we have Griffiths University with the Centre for Neuroimmune and Emerging Diseases who are looking mostly at uh, iron channel related work and there's a, a big group up there. And then I want to say something about our community of patients in Australia. Um, we're so lucky that we have highly engaged patients. Emerge Australia itself as an organisation commands a great deal of support from the patient community which we're very lucky to have. Um, one of the things, so we've got a number of things that we have done, we do support, we do advocacy, so we have direct support through the telehealth nurse service, through an info line, we do advocacy, we lobby government, we get involved in, in political political um, campaigning, um, we also do education, GP education, etc. Um, and then we're moving a little bit more towards research at the moment, especially with the biobank. So one of the things that we've done is we've set up a research digest, which I don't know if anyone has seen our research digest. Um, if you are involved in research and science in MECFS, I thoroughly recommend our research digest. Every two weeks, we pull together and we have some, we have scientists, PhD students, so we have really good quality people who review the papers and pull it into a synopsis. It's basically what I wanted as a busy CEO when I want to be kept abreast of the research and I put a team together to do this so that new papers that are published it really gives you one or two paragraphs on a need to know basis so if you haven't seen it do go along to our website it's emerge.org.au under the research tab you can sign up to have this delivered every two weeks or you can just read it online now this is something that is establishing a reputation for quality as well as the conference that we put on last year if our patients are interested in science and if our scientists are interested in patients, we do a good job at connecting the two. We have a patient advisory group. We have 40 people representative of all severities and we try and map that to the geography across Australia with the, with the prevalence in the population. And we ourselves have very good connections to research. We know the scientists and the scientists know us. So again, apologies for the, for the quality of this. This was just a little snapshot to show you some of the advocacy things that we've been involved with as an organisation where we've involved patients. Um, we did a petition about um, access to financial support last year and we had more than 10,000 signatures. Um, we had a telehealth campaign where patients sent letters to their federal MPs. More than 30% of our MPs were contacted by patients. We have... Um, events um, and we have at the bottom we have the federal funding renewed for Emerge Australia that my organisation was successful in being awarded more than a million dollars of federal funding uh, over four years so that's been incredibly helpful as well as with the state funding that we enjoy and we have great support from philanthropists and from members and, and, and donors around Australia. In terms of the research we have had funding for biomedical research into MECFS so would be last year now. We had three million dollars announced by the Minister for Health in Australia for a targeted call for research. So that has now, the applications have closed and they're reviewing the applications at the moment, but we're extremely pleased to see the investment in research in this area. Um, we had the NHMRC, that's the National Health and Medical Research Council, they conducted a report into MECFS and it was published last year and they received 292 <laughs> submissions about the, about the draft report, which was amongst the highest submissions that they'd ever received from the public, where the patients really got involved in saying what they liked and what they didn't like and we supported that process. And then the MECFS Biobank that I'm talking about today, there's a million dollar grant has been given from the Mason Foundation over five years to establish the Biobank. 
Um, and we also had money from the um, MRFF, the Medical Research Future Fund, um, and they funded the Anchor Project, which is about prevalence and the economic cost of MECFS. It's a modelling study, and it's run by the University of Tasmania, Deakin, and Emerge Australia. So we do have a lot happening. Now, moving on to the weakness. So when I thought about this, even from the beginning of looking at the biobank project, how do you do a biobank in Australia? There's a really obvious problem, right? So here is the obvious problem. This is Sydney. There's five million people in Sydney. This is, this is Melbourne. There's just under 5 million people in Melbourne. I think there's 4.9 million, and I think 4.6 million of them walk past my office in rush hour in the morning because we're about two streets away from this. So these two are, this is the Australia that you often see, that you often hear about, that you'd be familiar with. But this is also Australia. There's a lot of this. So 7, .9, uh, 7 million people, or 29% of Australia's population, live in places like this. And just to give you some numbers, I looked at the, the comparison. So in Australia, we have 25 million people spread out over a landmass of 7,692,000 square kilometres. In the UK, you have 66.4 million people spread over 242,500 square kilometres. So we are 31 times larger with less than half the population. Now, I've tried to do some sort of complex data modelling for you on the next slide. And I should say that my partner is is actually a data analyst and he specializes in presenting complex data in an understandable way but he didn't have anything to do with this <laughs> <laughs> and a thousand times actual size it should probably be about 16 but you know it's pretty representative so what we have is a bunch of people in Sydney we have a bunch of people in Melbourne I'm very proud of the fact that I included Tasmania and Ireland and uh, this is what the UK is. So in thinking about this, even when I was thinking about this from, from the beginning, with the UK Biobank, when you're collecting at a collection site in London, you're collecting, you're processing and you're storing, you've probably got 10 to 15 million people in, in that catchment zone just within an hour or two of where your collection site is. So if we chose a collection site in Sydney, then potentially we've got 5 million people. I also looked up to see the distance between these two places. And actually, I was, really, I was quite impressed by this because I thought, oh, what do I think the distance is? And I chose, um, I just thought I'd just type into Google, and I chose London to Aberdeen. And I'm quite impressed with myself because it's 877 kilometres between Melbourne to Sydney, and it's 878 kilometres between London and Aberdeen. So that gives you an idea that even in our two most, um, two most populous centres, we're still talking about, you know, what, however long that takes to drive, nine hours or something, I think the last time I drove to Aberdeen. Okay, so that's the weakness. Going back onto the positives, Let's think about the opportunities. So how are we actually going to do this? What good things do we have going for us that, that's going to make this possible? And I think there are four main things. We have telehealth, this network of pathology clinics that I talked about, GP education, and the symptom tracking app. So first of all, our telehealth nurse program. We've been involved um, for round about a year now in a pilot program established by the Centre for Community Driven Research. They have um, three sites, they're in Australia, they are in the UK, I'm not sure if it started here yet, and also in Switzerland. And what they've done is they've got a pilot project happening and the rationale behind this is that when a patient gets di newly diagnosed or when something changes with their diagnosis, you go to your doctor or you go to your specialist and you listen to the information and it's all, ooh, you know, all the information coming at you and it's just a, a bad place to be trying to take all the information in. So what CCDR have, have done is they said, look, where do patients go then when they go home? So they go home, they go onto Google, and they find the non-profit, they find the, the place with the information, which is your Action for MEs, it's your Emerge Australia, it's your panc um, Pancreatic Cancer Australia, or Ovarian Cancer Australia, it's those organisations where patients are going to really in their own time find the detailed information. So what CCDR said was, look, 
if we could provide really good, high-quality patient-related information within that non-profit um, arrangement, this is going to be a relatively low-cost, very high-impact intervention that, that we could do. So we were really lucky that we were one of 11 organisations chosen to be part of the pilot study in Australia. The project is funded for three years, and I've written here, it's popular, right? It's really popular. So we really got going round about August, September of last year. We already have a three to six month wait list. This means that we are already recruiting our second nurse. In fact, we have already recruited our second nurse. She's going to start next month. With the telehealth nurses and now having two in the office, this means we have a way of recruiting, informing and consenting patients for the biobank. It means that it's possible. It's possible to reach those people in regional and rural Australia or in different metropolitan centres all across Australia that we don't have to we don't have to not take them because they're not in that populous centre. We, we have a way of, of finding them. So we can get to them, we can find them, we can talk to them on the phone, we can we can recruit them, we can consent them, but then what happens? How do we get those blood samples and how do we get those blood samples to a processing centre? Oh, what did I do? Here we go. Um, and this is where the pathology clinics come in. So in Australia, we have a national and state network of pathology services. So it's completely routine. So you can probably tell I'm not actually properly Australian. I'm on my way. Um, but I am from the UK. Confusingly, I moved to Australia from California, so I've got experience of uh, a few different systems going now. When I lived in England, I remember that if you need to have pathology tests done, if you have a blood test taken and you're going to get your results, it pretty much all happens within the GP surgery or within the clinic that, that you go to. In Australia, it doesn't happen like that. You go to your doctor and your doctor decides, here is a list of things that I think we should look into, and they give you a piece of paper and they tick all of the things and give you the information, and they send you off to a pathology clinic, which is separate to the, the GP services. Now those pathology services are set up to do whether it's MRIs or the blood collection, blood sampling, all of those things, and then they send it to somewhere. So they then send it to uh, somewhere that is going to actually run the tests. So this happens, so if you're getting a blood test done in Alice Springs, it's not necessarily going to actually have that clinical pathology done in Alice Springs, it's going to get sent to Sydney or it's going to get sent to the nearest place where it can get to to have those tests done. So when we were looking at this, we, we kind of went, well, we could jump onto that, we could, we could get involved in doing that. Again, it means if we can get the patients from out in those different areas of Australia, in that normal system, we can send them to a pathology service, we can have the blood taken, and then we get it couriered somewhere. And where do we get it couriered to? Well, there's a national blood collection and storage service um, through Red Cross Lifeblood in Australia. Uh, we, there, is also, um, there are also some other biobanks, there is New South Wales State Biobank, there are various biobanks, there's some at Monash, there are some in Melbourne, and um, the one that we're working with at the moment is Red Cross Lifeblood, and that means that samples can get sent in the usual way to Sydney, where they will be processed and stored. So then we could come to GP education. Um, this is um, an initiative that we launched last year. We have launched the first accredited online GP education in Australia. Um, it's an hour, uh, yeah, it's an hour module, and what we're seeing is increasing confidence in medics. Now, I have to say, increasing. It's like the word improvement with MECFS, right? So there's a lot of qualifications around that, but. I do feel that we're going in the right direction to increase confidence in medics. That means that patients can work with their own GP. Now, detailed questionnaires, we're talking about using the symptom tracking app, and I understand what Alan means, that in terms of doing the questionnaires is very difficult. Um, but also, we do have the telehealth nurse. There is somebody in the office that can help them with this. And the detail is yet to be worked out, but this is the concept. We also have a medical advisory committee at Emerge Australia, so we have very good support and we have them who can, who can help us to develop things and, and get single questionnaires and get the right questionnaires and help us to, to coordinate this. 
Um, and then the last thing on my opportunities is collaborative big data. Um, the symptom tracking app, Sadie, is going to talk to us about this by video link tomorrow. Um, the symptom tracking app brings all of those patient questionnaires together that we might want to use. And it's going to give us, when we get this integrated in Australia, it's going to give us extensive data to accompany those biosamples. So those are all of the opportunities that we have in doing this. Now, how long have I got left? I've lost the time. So 15 minutes, I've got like three minutes left. OK, so this is the hard bit. So the threat. I think that there are, there are two threats. One is the quality of samples per population area and then the purity of the disease population. So in terms of the quality of samples, this is really what I was addressing before with that you know, fabulous data um, visualization exercise that I did for you. That population versus area means that we will have a legitimate concern about the quality of samples when they get to Sydney and the, the time it takes to transport things. We really want robust systems. We need to record where samples are top quality. We need to record carefully where there may have been issues. We need to continuously improve our systems. And I do see that there may be something which has sort of this is a quality one and this is a quality two or something. So this patient sample has, you know, got processed, it got stored within that, you know, three hours, four hours, six hours, whatever it is on that gold standard. And we will have the scientists checking this for us. We'll be discussing this and we're going to be open about the fact that that is a, a potential threat in, in our biobank. The second thing, the purity of disease population. So I just have really tried to put out on the screen how I'm thinking about things. And I'm really open to discussion in, in all the ways about what I see as probably one of the most challenging things for all of us working on patient recruitment and samples in this area. So what I've got, and this is pretty basic, okay, so I'm not, I'm not claiming my PhD is in medical ethics, not, not really a scientist. Um, so this is really the way that I look at it. First of all, the biggest thing is that this overall big green circle here is what a lot of average GPs out there working, trying to do good for their patients, are saying, well, this is chronic fatigue. You have chronic fatigue. Maybe you have chronic fatigue syndrome. But they're not diagnosing strictly by the Canadian Consensus Criteria or the Institute of Medicine. So if we can get this group, chronic fatigue, not CCC, and these are things like post-viral fatigue, overtraining syndrome, depression, anxiety, complex psych psychiatric, undiagnosed, other, et cetera, et cetera, you know all of those things. If we can get those out and just look at this, then it's a start. When you have this big hetero, you know, this big sort of um, mixture group of general fatigue, this is where we get most of my patients recover, exercise works, think yourself better, because it's just a, a big mixed sample. So that's the first thing. And in this room, we all know that that's what we need to do, right? But the thing that's really hard and that I find really challenging is the subgroups or confounding factors or differential diagnosis, whatever it is that we call these white circles that are in the, in the big blue circle. And I've also discovered that we're not using the same language as well. So some people are referring to these as subgroups. Some people are saying it's a confounding factor. And, and for doctors, it's just differential diagnosis. The things I've got there are, so maybe undiagnosed Lyme or tick-borne disease where people are reporting post-exertional malaise, that this is something that, you know, genuinely that, that they're experiencing. Um, CSF leaks that can be patched. We know that people with CSF leaks often have the, the same set of symptoms. Complex psychiatric. We do have complex psychiatric patients who are reporting all of the same symptoms. And yet, when you go through certain treatments that are more, you know, that are appropriate when treating in the complex psychiatric cohort, those patients can get better. Structural, gembrea, cervical, cr cranial cervical instability, um, putting on the neck braces um, and you know, the, the fusion operations. Functional neurological disorder, I don't know if that's a thing here, um, it's, it's certainly a thing in Australia. Um, and these are all, these, all of these things can also be diagnosed by CCC. So my last thing really is that 
I think good medicine means that we should be getting those people out of this group. So if we had all of the resources, if all of the doctors and all of the specialists and we could do that, then the more people we can get out of this MECFS diagnosed by CCC without confounding conditions, everyone who has something structural that is causing this, I want I want us to know about it, I want us to find it, and I want to get them better. If you can get people better, then this is the golden ticket, right? This is what we're all here for, it's what we want. What we say organisationally is that the people we're really concerned about are the people who are not getting better, the people who, for none of this doesn't apply, none of these things apply. So this is the purest sample, but what I kind of get, you know, find really difficult is, of course, there are some of these people that are still in this group. And the people where they do get better, so they have something, they find that there's structural or there's complex psychiatric, or, some, or sometimes they just have a significant improvement and they move out of the group. What are we doing with those samples? Are we labeling those samples? Are we still working on those samples? Are they our patients? Are they not our patients? So I'm sort of really struggling with this at the moment, and I'm very open to discussion and perspectives and you know all of the big brains that we have in this room to, to help me with this. So I'm almost there now. Um, just to go through our plan for the next few years, so as I say, it's five years of funding. Um, the way that the funding has been split has been that, um, and I liked what Christian said about that stuff in the middle, the dull stuff, that's what we're doing. I'm all about the dull part in the middle. Um, the funding for um, the Mason Foundation, MECFS Australian Biobank, has the setting it up, the logistics and, and just how it's structured. But we also have a hypothesis driven research element. So that is the collaborative research project. It's based on severity levels, but that's not really my bit to talk about. That's our, our collaborating partners. Our goal is to try and get 400 samples banked in the next five years. We're collaborating with Solve ME CFS patient organization in America. We're collaborating with Cure ME, and that's just on our side of the project, that dull bit in the middle. I don't think it's the I think it's the, it's the good bit. Let's rebrand it as the good bit, Christian. Um, so I want to say thank you and um, particularly special thanks to the Mason Foundation who funded the, the work that I'm talking about today. Thank you to CFSME Research Collaborative for bringing me here all the way here and um, all of the many generous supporters at Emerge Australia, our committee of management, the volunteers, the dedicated staff who enable us to do the work that we do. Thank <laughs> you.